Well, I have the distinct honor today of introducing all of our speakers. So I'd like to invite Clement Chen, who is the Senior Vice, Vice President and Chief Strategy Officer for the Health and Engineering Group at Lidos for our first talk. Oh, I'm sorry. I am Julie Radlinski. I also work for the Center for Engineering and Medicine. I'm our Senior Program Manager. My brain tends to be activated kinetically, so I'll, I'll wander around. Um, yeah, I'm actually the Chief Strategy Officer of the Lighters Health Group, so I am a strategist. And uh, strategists basically are those um, who didn't have enough practical grounding to be economists. <laughs> so, and given that economists will tell you tomorrow why what he or she said yesterday didn't come true today, I have zero credibility in anything I'm going to say today. But uh, uh, no, it, it's. Um, uh, Today's topic of what I'm going to be talking about is uh, leveraging digital innovation in healthcare. And think of it as not so much the giving of an answer as opposed to the posing of ideas and, and questions that um, you also take away for consideration. First, a minute about Lidos Health Group. We are a $1.8, $1.9 billion unit of the Lidos Inc., which is um, a publicly held company doing over $10.5 billion of revenue. Uh, in the national security, intelligence, uh, civil government, and healthcare um, arenas. We'd like to think of our health group as we're the largest health IT and managed, ser managed services company that no one's ever heard of. <laughs> so, so our stealth marketing campaign is working. <laughs> so, but um, so enough of that. When we talk about digital innovation, um, I started thinking going back in time to kind of get a better sense of where things are now. It was in the mid-2000s. I remember submitting a patent application related to network systems and methods related to business architectures. And that year, I think I was one of 400,000 applications. And I think that number in any given year is many hundreds of thousands. There are probably two million active patents right now and probably well over 10 million plus that have been approved over the years. So the thought occurred to me is, why with so much invention going on that the innovations of lasting import are so few and far between? Why is that? And one of the things I was thinking about is perhaps it's because invention doesn't equal innovation. And right, wrong, or indifferent, when all of us are thinking about innovation, digital or otherwise, our brains default to a belief that it has to be encapsulated as a product. And I think the minute we start marching down that path, we're on the road to perdition. And so let's think about some of this. If we think about innovation, uh, right around that time, uh, Business Week put out a really fascinating piece about the top 10, the top 15 innovations of all time. Now, in order to bound this, you got to ask yourself, well, what do you, uh, what do you, how do you define innovation? So we're not talking about what our friends at McIntyre and Darden are thinking about, which is cold, hard dollars. You know, if you're thinking about innovation as the most revenues, then you're probably thinking about mortgages or debt broadly. If you're thinking about profitability, you're probably thinking about refined oil. If you're trying to think about volume of product being moved, you're probably thinking about McDonald's hamburgers. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about innovation that fundamentally altered the, the way we live, the quality of life that we experience, basically um, um, improvements in the human condition or things that impacted the human condition, not necessarily as an improvement. So if you think of the list that they concocted back then, it was really extraordinary. Some of the items on the list, I think number one was weaponry. And that's, that's probably depressing beyond words. <laughs> but, but when you think about it, the first thing it did is altered what we ate. And then over time, it influenced the balance of power. Um, it basically be became a way of enforcing territorial disputes, et cetera, et cetera. But if you look at all the other items in the list, things like, uh, of course, there's always printing. Uh, but there was money, mathematics participatory democracy, um, limited liability, uh, property ownership, containerized shipping. 
when you look at the entire list, what you have to do is take a step and look in the entire list, not any one item within the list. And the first thing that struck me was not a single one of them was a product. All of them were platforms. And what a platform is, is kind of a broad-based capability that transcends markets, product categories, customers, um, industry verticals, whatever you want to call it, that has a tendency to have um, transformative impact. So that was kind of an interesting revelation to me. Now I fast forward to today in healthcare. So, you know, Business Week kind of gave us one perspective. And I always, uh, are you all familiar with HIMSS, the, the big health IT conference every year where we all gather in either Vegas or Orlando with 45,000 of our closest friends. And, and we all start singing from the hymnal of the buzzword of the week. And uh, the buzzword bingo in healthcare these days over the last five, 10 years has been big data, analytics, population health management, uh, precision engagement, uh, physician engagement, patient engagement, mobile health, and now, of course, our favorite, AI, ML, blockchain. When I think of mobile health as an example, there's probably 100,000 apps right now related to mobile health, anything on your smartphone or your, your watch or what have you. And I have to ask you, does that look like it's on a bullet train to the top 15? Or does it look like most of those things are gonna fall by the wayside of the millions of inventions that are doing nothing for anybody right now? And that's a rhetorical question. So what do we do about that? H how does the innovation equation ascend beyond just another product, one of many? How do we, how do we get the signal to noise ratio improved? Uh, let me offer up some ideas uh, for, for consideration. The first is, um, it all starts with the customer, or more specifically, the circumstance that the customer is in. What I would submit that what we need along with the technology innovation and R&D that we're doing, we need customer demand function R&D. And what I mean by that is, for, for instance, um, um, most of us don't actually want more healthcare. In fact, I would say that none of us want more health care. All of us want more health or wellness. And if we can achieve that without having to actually interact with a health care system that oftentimes is very inconvenient, that's even better. And so with that sort of reality facing the consumer, you can see why the retail clinics took off with such uh, enormous popularity and that innovation wasn't so much a technical innovation. That was a confluence of a circumstance and a unique way of satisfying the unmet need born out of that circumstance. And I think that's how we have to think about um, innovation moving forward. Because, you know, as Theodore Levitt said, the customer wants quarter inch holes, not quarter inch drills. And many of our innovation efforts in health, specifically in the technology area, is all about the quarter inch drill. And the problem is, once you're doing quarter inch drills or hammers or whatever, if you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And if it really is a nail, you're gonna do your best to make sure it looks like a nail. And then therefore, having missed the entire circumstance and the unmet need born out of real authentic desires that are not being satisfied, and you will miss the market. That's the first thing. The second thing, I'll start off with a story and that'll perhaps imprint to you what, what I'm thinking about here. It was probably about seven years ago, I was uh, giving a healthcare talk at Georgetown. And it was the same week that uh, Bono, the lead singer for U2, was giving a talk. So he was on a Monday, I was on a Tuesday. And Tuesday I was in front of the audience saying, hey, you know, you folks at Georgetown, it's your lucky week. First you have Bono, then you have Clement. <laughs> yeah, it's a strategy joke. <laughs> But U2 um, is one of my favorite bands of all time. And it has nothing to do with Bono or his politics or his singing. It has everything to do with The Edge, the guitarist. And any, any guitarists in, or musicians in the group here? Not a one? 
Oh, okay, maybe a sort of one. Okay. Uh, there you go. Hey, hey we're, we all sing in the shower, so it's, so it's good. But um, the magic of U2 is the guitar playing of the edge. You can always, there's a very distinctive sound, and you can't put your finger on it. But um, there are some of us that have actually analyzed this to death, which shows that we have way too much discretionary time on our hands. And what you notice is they're very distinct sound. It's the way he um, lags the notes. There's a delay, the echo associated with, with um, a note that he happens to play. And he originally started doing this in the, uh, the war albums and all that in the 80s, but he, he really blew it open during the, um, the, the Joshua Tree album uh, about 30 years ago. And what he's using is a delay pedal that every time he hits it, it creates a uh, um, an echo. But that echo is so incredibly hard to replicate no matter what you're doing. So some of us have done some analysis on this, and we figured out a very interesting discovery. If you take the number of echoes per minute divided by the number of beats per minute, a very interesting figure arises. And that ratio is 2.71828182845945. That number is E. For all you mathematicians in the audience, you know what I'm talking about. A very important number in mathematics. It, it explains a lot of multiplicative phenomenon. It's uh, used in calculating interest payments. It's, it's really an incredible thing. So what Edge did was he, at your brain likes E. That's why when you hear a U2 song and you hear that his guitar starts ringing out, it resonates with your brain in some way, shape, or form. I doubt Edge is a mathematician, but somehow, right, wrong, or different, he stumbled upon this thing, and it's all about the pattern. Pattern recognition is probably the single most important dimension of what innovation is about. And it doesn't necessarily have to involve invention. It's about, you know, Thoreau said, all perception of truth is a detection of an analogy. And in many ways, in this world that we're living in right now, where everything is becoming more and more ubiquitously connected, it allows a much frictionless cross-pollination of insight and um, innovation in one realm to be applied in another. And the important thing is, can you create parallel identification of what that problem pattern is that is in one area that may or may not have been solved and whether or not it's applicable in another? And rather than talk hypothetically about it, I'll give you an example that we at Lidos are, do are doing right now. The pattern is, well, one of the patterns is, it's not necessarily all about big data. It's actually, I mean, big data is gonna, it's gonna proceed along the path that it's going to proceed along. But the problem that's plaguing healthcare today is little data and lack of big workflow. That is a much different problem. That's the pattern that we're seeing over and over again. It isn't that IBM Watson didn't come out with the latest algorithm to figure out how to deal with glioblastoma or whatever. The problem that everyone experiences without exception is that minute that you move between a department in an acute setting, or if you move out of the acute setting into a post-acute care rehab facility all the way to the home, or whether you're visiting one doctor in one clinic here and a specialist over there, nothing follows you in a coherent way. That is the problem that we have been addressing in the national security area in command and control at Lidos for almost half a century. All of the systems and all of the um, architectural approaches to innovation and solving those problems, we are now training that on the healthcare problem. And so the early, we're early days, but I, we can start to see the potential transformative impact of applying national security problems in command and control to the case management, care coordination, um, in the industrialization of the health operations problem that we're experiencing in spades in the healthcare side. Again, what we have to focus on is the problem itself and not on the quarter inch drill. It's not about shoving a command and control system into a health environment, it's about establishing the actual parallels or lack of parallels between the problem pattern that's being experienced. That is the key. So in the third area, and probably the last one I'll touch upon, is uh, getting back to the Business Week uh, article about platforms. It is about platforms. 
And the reason is because in an environment, and this is all founded on network theory, and if I had more time, if, I'm, if Julie invites me back to talk to UVA again, I'll spend hours going through why this is the case. But for now, you just have to take it on faith. In a highly ubiquitously connected environment, um, there's nothing that you have as a product today that can't be sold as a service. Everything can be serviceized. And you don't have to look any further than Uber, Airbnb, or just about any consumer technology right now. You can basically convert ownership to a problem of access. And access to a capability, not to a product. Platforms is how it's, how it's gonna make it happen. Think of platforms as the factory that produces endless services that accomplishes a mission that uniquely meets the authentic need of a customer in a particular situation. That is the holistic connection that has to be made if we're gonna leverage digital innovation in a way that's productive and effective. I'm particularly heartened about what Jeff was talking about uh, and John about what's happening with the Link Lab here because at the heart of innovation is interdisciplinary insight. You know, it's been said that your system and your solution, whatever, is perfectly engineered to produce the results that you're experiencing. In healthcare, uh, it wouldn't be anyone, uh, uh, most folks would not define it as a well-oiled machine right now. The folks that brought you the problem aren't necessarily the folks that are gonna fix it. The answer is gonna come somewhere else. And it oftentimes comes at the soft underbelly of interdisciplinary integrative thinking that tends to yield in a punctuated equilibrium sort of way where it tends to gain a foothold in a hinterland somewhere addressing a unique problem in a very authentic way and then it migrates into the herd the mainstream that's how it's going to happen so the fact that uh, you know uva is uh, rather um, visionary in how it's having its medical school interact with its engineering school that's only part of it it gets even bigger than that and it plays to all the other disciplines of uva as an example and this is the last thought i'll leave with, leave with you the U.S. healthcare system is a runaway train in terms of cost. You all know the statistics. You know we're on, we're, uh, on a rapid path to 20% of GDP, all about health. Well, this is the thing that's really interesting to see. If you look at all the developed countries across the world, the developed countries, the U.S. is like ranked number 31 or something in terms of life expectancy, even though our spending per capita is orders of magnitude higher than everybody else. And the question is, why is that? Well, if you take the aggregation of health spending with what I would call broadly social services spending, you will see that in all developed countries, those percentages largely have convergence. They all sit around 25, 30%, roughly thereabouts. US stands alone, though, in going Pareto in the opposite direction. We spend all our stuff on health and very little on the social determinants of health, whereas every other developed country has it the other way around. The sooner we start to grasp the, the magnitude of what that deficit means to us and we start to actively address this problem, you will start to see that it's not just going to be the School of Engineering with the medical school. It's gonna be the whole of what is being offered at UVA that's gonna really matter. Because in today's environment, the further you can push the front door to the health system, I would call it the further you can push the front door to the wellness system, particularly to the home, that's how you're gonna solve the problem. And that's gonna necessarily involve nutrition, education, transportation, um, all that good stuff. And with that, I think I have, um, Exercise my 25 minutes, or 20 minutes, and I'll have five minutes for questions if anyone has any. And if not, I'll be around, um, at, I guess at the end, we're having a little, a little discussion at the end. Any questions or comments from anyone in the audience? Oh, that's it. Thank you.